All right. The sales interview presentation. Let's start on the middle row at the back. Okay, my name is Keaton Squires. Uh, I chose to interview Brian Minke, who is the owner of Auto Spa LLC, which is a high-end detailing shop here in the city. They focus on high-end cars, high-end clients. Typically, don't touch a car for less than a couple hundred dollars. Um, I learned three things. Number one thing I learned is it's not only in what you know, but it's in who you know. Meet as many people as you can while you're anywhere and everywhere. Um, and you never know what they may do for you, so make sure you make a good impression. Always be presentable. You are the face of the company and ultimately what the customer buys. <coughs> um, learn to read people and their expectations and give them what they want, not what you want. That will create a successful business in the long run, not the short term. In conclusion, being an honest, trustworthy business owner will create a good, loyal customer base and a good reputation. Okay. So why did you choose them? Uh, because he's been my mentor for the last couple of years in my detailing business, and I kind of wanted to get an insight on his business as well. Okay. So they have a car detailing business? Yeah, mobile. All right. And how much do you charge? Uh, it depends. I, I, like I said, I like to focus on the customer's expectations. I'll build a package for what the customer wants. From me. Okay. So what's your average? Uh, 150 to 200. And what's his what's his average? Five hundred to seven hundred. Five hundred. Oh, wow. Okay. Big difference there. Oh yeah, for sure. A lot of variance. Oh yeah. Okay. Thanks. Very good. good job. All right. My name is Jake Winters. I interviewed Taylor Gossett. He is an account manager for um, Snapple Dr Pepper which an account manager, he said, is basically a sales rep. Um, the three things, oh, and I <coughs> him because he is the only salesperson that I actually could think of, that I actually know. Um, one, one thing that I learned is about him and what he does is that he, he's the type of person where he loves working Monday through Friday. And in a sales job, you can pretty much work Monday through Friday. Um, the second thing I learned is in his job, he doesn't do a lot of prospecting. Um, his accounts are pretty much given to him, but if like an on queue opened up down the street, then he could go prospect that on queue. Um, and the third thing I learned was that the most important thing that he said, and I didn't even bring it up, was to be um, just ethically sound. So you want your clients to trust that you know what you're doing and you want them to think that you are making the best decision for them, not necessarily just to get money. Um, and in conclusion, I learned that his job is very laid back and he really, really loves it. Okay. Does he actually, um, yeah, is it commission based? Mm -hmm. asking that? So he does yeah. get a commission. He only makes, I think his salary is like 19 or 20,000, um, but he makes probably 60 or 70 with commission. Mm -hmm. So how does he, it seems to me that the demand for, so he sells for Snapple and Dr. Pepper right. is sort of fixed. How do you get, how do you get customers to buy more? Um, so he has what he calls big box stores, which is like Walmart, Target, Crest, places like that. And if he has like a Snapple product going on sale, he can say, well, will you buy more of this product and a display? To put in the middle of the aisle, right? Something like that. Or an end cap. Right. Right. All right. Interesting. Very good. Thanks. Hi, I'm Ellen Tarson. I interviewed Elaine Dean. She is the sole proprietor of the Dean Lively Gallery, downtown Edmond. What they do there is they customize framework and then uh, she works in the front and does art sales for the art sold there. It's both international and uh, local artists that are shown. Uh, three things that I learned are that, one, you don't really need a college degree to do what she does. She didn't never get a college degree. She graduated from high school, and it's all self-taught. Uh, two, her target art audience was the um, baby boomers. 
So after 27 years, she was now closing down the place. And I figured that if you want to be successful, you need to have your target audience to be more flexible, especially with technology. Mm -hmm. um, technology is changing the way that people are even going to art galleries because that's what she's seeing. The youth of this generation is not even going in through her doors. So uh, which brings me to the third conclusion. Um, she is definitely closing after 27 years and then uh, she wanted to be more open to change. If I, if I asked her like, what does she want to change in her past? It was to be more open to change. And um, so she's closing her business. Is that what you said? After twenty-seven years. After twenty-seven years. Yeah. Okay. But that's all because you know nobody really goes to art galleries anymore. She told me that the uh, art museum downtown of DC mm -hmm. had already laid out fourteen employees. Because people are buying stuff. It's amazing to me that they're buying art online. You can buy. <laughs> paintings from artists on Etsy and these different sites and that's that seems to be the way your generation actually goes by. I can't imagine because you just don't you, from a picture it's hard to <coughs> see exactly you know what you're going to get. She's never uh, also made online sales. She's only done face to face. Maybe she should do online sales. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, that, might have, that might have saved your business. It's interesting that she said she, you don't need a college degree. Yeah. That's not true with people like Paycom. I mean, they're, yeah. and in fact, one of the things that I learned from Paycom is that I used to tell students, I graduated in my undergraduate degree with a four point. I was the outstanding student in the college um, the year I graduated. And so I was also the class marshal of the college. Um, and I used to say, I mean, if you wanted to, the reason I did that was because I wanted to go to law school. And in, at that point in time, in order to get into law school, you had to take the LSAT, and you could only take it one time. You could take it more than that, but no school that was reputable at that time would count anything more than your first attempt at the LSAT. And I was always a good test taker, but there's always the outside possibility that you'll have a bad day when you take the LSAT, right? That you'll be sick, that something will happen. And in fact, something did happen the day I took it. The fire alarm went off in the building that I was in that was taking it and they didn't cancel our stores. And so we were sitting out, it was in July, and we were sitting out in the parking lot in the heat and they wouldn't let us move even to the shade. So it was not a good day. I still scored in the 80th percentile um, on the LSAT in spite of that. So I, I could have gone anywhere. But the way you get into law school is they basically take your GPA, your undergraduate GPA, they multiply it by four, and then they um, add 100 points to it. And that gives you something in the range of the LSAT score. They combine those scores into what's called the composite index. And then schools just go down the list. Basically, if they have 100 slots, they just go down the list. And all of those letters of recommendation and stuff like that matter not unless you're what we call bubble children. So there will be a whole bunch of people in the middle that will be that last spot that they'll be looking for. They'll all have the same composite index. And that's where they'll turn to looking at letters of recommendation and other things that you've done. And I didn't want to be one of these, what we call bubble children, right? So I, I graduated with a 4.0 so that I could ensure that I go to law school. And the reason I tell you this is because I used to tell my students, my, my wife, my, my second wife, uh, used to say, much to my annoyance, I was a college professor when she was going through college. And she used to say, C's get degrees. And that was what she shot for, was to be a C student. And that just absolutely annoyed the living hell out of me as a college professor that you know somebody would be that lackadaisical about their. But the truth of the matter is I used to tell students, nobody's going to look at your transcript when you get out of here. Nobody's going to ask to see your transcript. They're going to ask if you have a degree, and they're not going to look at your transcript. Well, that's changed. In an era in which we can use so many metrics to determine Lots of companies, and Paycom is one of them now, that will not hire anybody who has under. They've looked at all these metrics. They put in all of these statistics on their top performers, and what they found is that their top performers have a 3.75 or better in their undergraduate. So they will not hire anybody at Paycom who doesn't have a 3.75 or better. 3.75, by the way, qualifies you to be a magna cum laude in terms of graduation. So I used to say that that didn't matter, that grades didn't matter, C's get degrees, and that's all that matters. They are now looking, there are companies, big companies like Paycom, ADP, um, Gartner, companies like that are looking to see, and if you don't have the, the 3.75, they just won't hire you.
So think about that as you start studying for for exam. I didn't agree with it. I just thought it was interesting that she A lot of salespeople say that, you know, like I, I didn't I didn't need to agree, I just started selling. And they usually sell business to consumer products. And that's true in the business. I mean, you know, you don't need to agree to sell cars. You can go, I mean, most car dealerships uh, would hire, will hire you if you've got a good personality and they think you've got a good work, work ethic. That's not what most of our students want to do. Though. I just feel like so. all my sales get hurt there. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure it did. It's changed the way. I mean, I never thought we would buy clothes online. I thought, that, but we do. You know, I buy clothes online. She's just going to so. keep it up with the change. So yeah. That's what she's building. Okay. Very good. Interesting. <laughs> My name is Nikki. Uh, I interviewed Adam Williams. He works for Zill's Diamond Store. Um, I chose him because he, out of all of the salespeople I know, he's very well put together, I think. Um, he seems very successful. So I kind of wanted to get a look at um, his view on retail sales. A um, couple things that I learned from him. Uh, money will change a person's drive. Uh, how we talked about um, is he's been in uh, sales for I think 15 years or so and um, up until working for sales everything was salary based so now he's on a commission base and it completely changed the way that he approaches customers and everything um, before he was just kind of going to the job, doing the movements and now that he's commission based he actually builds those relationships with his customers and uh, it's helped him progress in his company. Um, another thing that I learned is that sales are very competitive um, in two different ways. Uh, so he was telling me that <coughs> not only um, like for his customers, like they want to get the best deal that they can. So they'll like, he has to sell them on their products or they're going to go somewhere else. But also, there's competition within the store because it is commission based. Um, so, like, if you are gone a day on your day off, and that customer comes back in to buy something from you, and someone else takes that sale, you just lost out on that commission. Uh, if you didn't sell that customer yourself, basically. Um, another thing I learned, kind of like how Keaton said, it's not what you know; it's who you know. Um, you know, his customers, they they wear all this jewelry and everything, and then they go out and, you know, somebody's like, oh, my God, I love that ring. Where did you get it? And that brings in more customers for him. Um, so in conclusion, I guess from him, I learned that, you know, like I said, just building those relationships really helps you progress. But also, I do not want to go sales at all. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Not everybody <laughs> wants to go into sales. So is he GIA certified? <coughs> he? Um, I believe so. And that's one of the things, that's an industry where that's a big deal is to, to know about gemstones and to be certified so that you can actually talk intelligently to your client base about the quality of various yeah. uh, stones and settings and things like that. So that's, I mean, in, in that field, in that subfield, that's a certification that's more important than maybe like a college degree because people want to know if your card says that and people who buy a lot of jewelry know that then they can trust you that you're not going to tell them. One of the things you can buy, Walmart and Sam's are the largest retailers of diamonds in the world now. But you go to Walmart or Sam's and you ask to, you know, you ask the person behind the jewelry counter what grade the stone, and they can look at the card, and you know, but that's about all they can tell you. I mean, they'll get they'll get a loop out for you to look at it, but you know, it's it's not the same as having somebody who's actually certified who knows yeah. and can you know, sort of back up what they're saying with some knowledge base. So that's kind of an interesting sure he, like, he was telling me all the different, um, like how there's 102 facets to each diamond and all the different colors. Like there's, mm -hmm. I don't even know how many colors of a diamond. And yeah. Stuff. Yeah. The three C's. Yeah. Color, clarity, 
color, carrot, and clarity are the things that, that, that influence the amount that you'll spend per time. So, okay, very good. What? I'm not ready yet, I just want to. Okay. Hello, my name is Brittany Deer, and then I interviewed a guy named Taylor Cecil, who works at Cummings in Florida, California, which is like a car dealership. And then stuff I learned from him was his toughest obstacle over time is being comfortable with the environment. Like when he first got there, like he didn't know everyone, but then over time he learned people. And from that, he was just more comfortable and able to do better at his job. And then the second thing I learned from him was to adapt to different types of people and like how to sell to different types of people. Like not everyone's going to want the same vehicle, like a family won't want. Or something that they want, like a suburban or something kind of thing. And then the third thing I learned from him was like work hard and don't just don't get distracted and don't get discouraged. So like if you don't do like really good stuff, don't just be like overly mad at yourself, just keep striving to work on it. And then in conclusion, what I learned from him was just like wake up every day positive and give your job your all and always be ready to learn more. It's like you can always learn more. There's just so much to learn. And really, that's all I got from him. So Why'd you choose somebody in Weatherford? So I don't really know. Yeah, I mean, I'm close from there. Oh, okay. So, so I mean, I'm going for car sales. All right. So is he totally commissioned? Yeah, I think so. Some car dealerships will you start out with you draw, but you have to earn it back when it comes out. You know, but they give you something so that you're not starving to death when you start out. Yeah. But you have to earn it pretty quickly. Most of our business to business sales will be a commission base of about fifty thousand plus. So they'll have a base salary, which is nice because it means that you, you know, can start, and particularly if you're building the territory and having to prospect, not start to death and worry about that. Obviously, if you don't sell enough to pay for your salary, they're going to fire you. But it is, it's a, for a lot of people, the business to business sales context is a lot easier. It's one of the reasons that there's less turnover in B2B than there is in. You know, if you go to Mathis Brothers, I don't think I've ever seen the same salespeople twice in <laughs> Mathis Brothers. They're, they're, they just filter through there because they're, you know, they're not very good. And that's the same as with car dealerships a lot of times. All right, good deal. Let's go to the next. Let's see. My name is Austin Elliott. I interviewed Mason Brown, who sells insurance from a business called The Insurance Store. And the three most important things I learned from him were was that uh, insurance has the possibility to make a really high commission rate, and basically the whole business is run off the commission rate besides the people that they pay hourly, just to be like assistants or whatever. But the majority of the business runs off the commission, and uh, next, uh, just learning like about more like how insurance works. They don't like work for like. State Farm or like Progressive, like particularly like they just sell like different packages from different companies, so they don't they're not like tied just to like one. So that was interesting, and mostly everything they sell they can get up to a fifty percent commission on, depending on like the package and everything, what it is. Um, and then the third thing I learned was just that it's a family-owned business. His dad and his uncle started it, and. Multiple, multiple members of their family work there and have worked there for five or six years already. So it's kind of a known family business to them. And the conclusion I gained was that insurance has a high upside uh, to make money, but it's also a very detailed and technical business to get into. Okay, what's their, what is, I just did a sales training program for an insurance agency here in Edmond. What's their entry? How do they get customers? Um, they have uh, radio ads. I know that so that's like one of the big things. And then they have a Facebook ad. And then uh, I think it's just like hearsay. They know they have ads in like like just like different like newspapers like from their area and things like that. And they have a storefront. So I think more of just like people telling others and just What's like their, kind of. Did they tell you what their biggest product line is? Um, their biggest product line is car insurance. I think. Car. Sure that it's like their like number one that they usually go for just because they can sell it pretty easily. That's what yeah. Everybody has to have that, right? I mean, you have to have that. 
Uh, it's required by law. And so it's sort of the way you get into uh, dealing with a customer when they, they come in looking for auto insurance. But one of the things that's happened is that traditional insurance sales has seen a disruption in the market because you can now go online and buy this, right? And you can And you can shop it yourself. Your generation wants to shop it yourself. You want to get on Progressive, and Progressive will show you the quotes of other agencies, you know, other insurance carriers. And so a lot of people are going online, and that's really affected. It's one of those things where, yeah, if you can get them in, one of the things that happens is once you get a customer in insurance, you get residuals off that, right? Every year when they renew, and a lot of people simply go with who they've had forever they because the switching costs are so high in that. And most people don't want to take the time to, to rebid every single year. And so once they start with something, they just sort of automatically renew. But the online has really affected the ability of insurance agents to make you know, the... the, the state farm agents and things like that that are out in the field to make money. And so they're having to look at actually going out. One of the things that they were telling me at this insurance agency that, that I did this training for is that, yeah, historically what they did is, you know, people came in, they knew state farm, they uh, went into, you know, it was basically maybe a convenience thing. The state farm agent was the closest office to their house. That's no longer true because you get online. So they're actually having to go out and look for business to business insurance. Because that's a more profitable, and b people are more educated in that market. Whereas for most of you, particularly college students, what's your primary concern when you buy insurance? Cost. Yeah, all you care about is how cheap it is. That's pretty much like when when every dollar counts. And I remember this when I was a college student. It wasn't that long ago. I know that you think that I'm like Venus born of the foam and never sat where you sat, but that's that's certainly not true. When I was in college, the only thing I cared, I mean, I didn't, you know, I, I, I didn't care about all of the other stuff. And um, I just cared about how cheap it was. Like I just want, I want basic coverage. Um, and that was, that worked until you started buying a bigger vehicle and then you could worry about things like, you know, if I get in an accident, are they, are they gonna depreciate the value of this car? All right, good deal. Um, I have the same thing for state farm insurance. And I think uh, I interviewed the person that you're talking about. Uh huh. Okay. Carrie Fuquay? No. Okay, no. Well, well, that's the guy I'm interviewing. He's Kirk Fuquay. Um, what? You got to tell your class your name. My name is Eduardo Perez. Okay. And the guy I interviewed, his name is Kirk Fuquay. He's a state farm agent. And the three things that I learned from him were that you have to know how to deal with when a customer tells you no. He says most of the sales come with like the period, the third or the fourth call, so know how to deal with no. Um, the second thing was that to create a good customer experience, you know, that's that's how you're gonna keep your customers and how to you're gonna keep more you're gonna get you're gonna be able to get more customers coming to you. You getting good experiences, so like when he gets a customer, he uh, washes their car, <coughs> gives them snacks, and stuff like that. And the uh, third thing that I don't know is that to have a referral based uh, business, I guess. So with every customer that he sells, he gives them a twenty five dollar gift card for every ten names that the customer gives him, and that's how he grows his business. Okay. All right. And your conclusion? My conclusion is. Um, have a referral, referral based business and know how to deal with no. Okay. All right. Very good. Good deal. So, do you want to do insurance sales now? Uh, probably not. No. <laughs> <laughs> probably not. Okay. Right? Yep. Any motion? Yeah. Um, good morning. Hello, everybody. My name is Kim Don Williams, and I interviewed my, he's my uncle, but he's not like my blood uncle, so not a family member. Uh, Brian MacArthur. He does commercial real estate in Mansfield, Texas. Uh, three things that stood out. The first thing is image. He said image is very important in this industry, and I didn't really think it would be as important as he made it seem. So basically, he's like, you're always in campaign <coughs> mode. So even when you're just driving to get coffee, and you're not at work. He brought. He purchased a red Corvette. So it kind of contributes to his image. He said that people like shiny flashy stuff and like that's good for him it's like a foot in a door technique 
type of thing. So I found that very, very uh, interesting, very interesting. And the next thing that I learned is he said that you need to always know the economy. Uh, I don't really like politics and I'm not really interested in the economy, but he said I need to become more interested in the economy. So that's something cool about that job, I guess. And the last thing is he said that you need to know how to network. So obviously any business you're gonna to have to know how to network, but he said networking is very, very important, excuse me, for commercial real estate because the people that your clients are gonna know each other because basically they're all businesses. So they're gonna talk and they're gonna be like, hey, you, who did you get this building from? Uh, Ken Don Williams, one of the agents that are out. You know what I'm saying? You understand what I'm saying? Uh, in conclusion, I give speeches, so I'm used to like feedback. So it's weird to like eighth graders speeches, like ninth graders. So it's weird for y'all to be sitting here quiet and just. Listening. But in conclusion, in conclusion, uh, I do not want to do commercial real estate anymore because it is like it's kind of like you just you're a puppet for a company. Unless I have my own company, then yeah. But otherwise, no. So you've eliminated one area that you uh, that you know you don't want to go into is commercial real estate. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting that you said that. Um, I agree that image is important, mm -hmm. and one of the things that is important in that, particularly in the real estate market, is being able to say I'm a top producer. People want, particularly if they're going to list property with you, they want to know that you're going to do it. So is most of it is. So I have a couple questions. Is most of it actually sales or is it leasing? Does he do commercial leasing? Sales. Yes, it is sales. sales. But he does have his uh, independent, like, own separate from okay. the business he works with. Where he does is leasing. Okay. Because so. most businesses want to lease, and mm -hmm. there's a reason that they want to lease, mm -hmm. which is if you actually buy property and you have capital improvements on the property, you have to depreciate that property out over. A certain period of time, it's not a 100% tax write off. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you lease buildings, most commercial property want to lease mm -hmm. because it's 100%. There's a tax advantage to writing it off mm -hmm. the 100%. So I that's think, interesting. I think one of his uh, largest sales are is farmland. I think it's farmland. So, okay. um, lots of farmers lease too. Mm -hmm. I think they, they lease farmland. In fact, I have, a, I have a farm and we have a farmer that leases it for. For weeks, <coughs> he can write off the entire amount of the lease um, on his business as a business expense. I think it's interesting that he says he has a Corvette. I have never known a real estate agent that had a Corvette. Yeah, and there's said, a reason for that. Yeah, he said that it, and it makes sense. I mean, it's completely logical. If you have an agent that's driving a hoopty, like with hubcaps on it, it's like, why would I even want to do business with this guy? But if you pull up in this red Corvette drop top, go to some Drake in future. It's like, dang, this dude is cool. Let's let's get let's do some business. Okay, as a business person, I'm horrified by that. I would be like, this guy is gonna fleece me. You know, like I I would be like, I I don't think you should. I mean, I would be like, wow, dude. You know, like no, but yeah, tone it down. Like you know, four door Lexus sedan is what I'm looking. First of all, it's interesting that he has that because. A, I would be, as a business owner, and I own a business, I would be horrified by anybody who showed up and that. That's just, that's me. And I'm gonna acknowledge that there are, there's a lot of variants out there. Second, if you have clients that actually, for example, if they're flying in, let's say you have clients that are flying into the airport, and you've got a whole team of people that are looking to open an office in Oklahoma City, and you show up at the airport in a Corvette. And no, that's when you get the, the Mercedes. Or uh, you know, so now you have to go rent something. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, all right. I, I, I just I think that's, that's interesting. Um, I do agree with him that you should know the economy because there are I mean there are obviously limitations in every business. There are products, by the way, that do really well in economic hard times. What kinds of products do you think? Where what kinds of sales could you go into that you're gonna make a lot of money during economic bad times? Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Alcohol sales usually double. Whoa. So people who are distributors of, of alcohol, Byron's liquor, stuff like that, they do really, really well in the down in the down economy. All right, I do agree with them. Networking is really critical, and particularly in the business business commercial real estate market, that's going to be a big deal. 
And I think that's one of the things that kind of deterred me too, because when he was speaking on networking, he was like, he feels fake a lot. Like no real conversation is like too, too much business. So I, I couldn't do it. My shirt's shrunk in the dry this morning. <laughs> so I'm trying not to lift up my shoulders too much. <laughs> random, random, random. Uh... Things you learn. <laughs> okay. Um, my name is Myra Lopez, and I interview Eric Loya. He has five years of sales experience working with Hilti. Uh, which is a tool manufacturer, and also he's now with Cox Communications. Um, I don't know what I was going to say. Okay, so what I learned was that aside from money being the motivation, he said his opportunity is to serve. He really likes to help people, and I guess that just gives him some satisfaction just knowing that he helps someone, and especially if they come back. Uh, another thing I asked was uh, what was a pro of it? And he said, getting paid for the results that you create, which I thought was a really cool thing to say because he's a very creative person and he uh, really enjoys just creating anything in general, whether that's music, uh, working with people, school, anything like that. Um, and then the final thing is, again, networking. Like you said, networking is really important. Um, not only does that help you with sales, but that helps you uh, social, socially and everywhere else. Um, in conclusion, uh, learn to deal with reje rejection and make sure to give customers a positive experience because it makes your job a whole lot easier. Okay. So he switched. That's a big switch from healthy tool sales to Cox Communication. What's he selling? Cox is a business to business. Uh, he's doing mainly residential, but he does do some business to business. Okay. But yeah, he was with them. With Hilti first, but they ended up uh, moving to Dallas, I believe, and he did a head farm with them. So that kind of led to working with Cox Communications. Okay, so he switched industries. Yeah, and that's and that, that switching not just industries, but going from I'm gonna guess Hilti was primarily business to business sales. Yes, probably going out and selling um, for you know big. Uh, Mechanics and things like that, big mechanic shops that construction places that use a lot of tools. So um, to go into business to consumer, then that's a big, big it's switch, big and it's a big switch in industry from a product, a tangible product, to one that's intangible. Yeah, and everybody hates. Right. I mean, like, I, I, does anybody love their cable provider for the most part? I and mean, it's just one of those things that I think most people really dislike. So that's kind of interesting. Okay, very good. Good job. My name's Taylor, Taylor Barnes. I interviewed Matthew Goodner, who is my store manager at T-Mobile. Um, I'm really interested in retail sales, specifically in the wireless industry. Um, it's like a real deal job. Our store manager makes like $75,000. So people kind of think a little bit less of retail, I guess, a way to make money. But in this specific retail industry, you can do really, really well. Um, so I learned quite a bit from Matt and three of the things that I really took away. Um, Matt always sells ethically. So especially in wireless, we have a lot of spiffs where manufacturers will say, if you sell this iPhone, we'll give you an extra 10 bucks, things like that. Um, Matt says it's important not to sell based on those. Like they consider it a lucky bonus if you get one not change your tactics um, and stop right fitting your customers making sure they get exactly what they need um, just because it's going to make you an extra five dollars here and there um, as salespeople, uh, we kind of tend to have a little bit of product bias based on what we think is the best um, and what we think is the best and what might actually be the best might not be the best thing for the customer um, his example of that was if a customer comes in and says you know, I had an LG TV and it was a POS, like, even if LG has the best TV out, like, I'm not going to try to sell that person an LG TV because they had a really bad experience with it in the past. 
Um, the last thing was that he always took the extra mile for his customers. So he had a situation in which uh, the lady's phone got shipped off with stuff she needed on it. He somehow got it back, really went the extra mile for her. Uh, because he did that, she was really pleased with his service. Uh, she had five daycares and ended up contracting Best Buy for uh, all of their security systems that they did put into those. So it was over 100,000 in sales just from being nice to one person. So I think that's uh, something that's really important, especially in the retail setting. Like you see a lot of people and a lot of them are upset, but if you can turn that experience into a positive one, <coughs> it can help your paycheck too. Um, so in conclusion, uh, my two takeaways from this really were that it, we really are in an era of relationship marketing, like all of our features are right, this is real. Um, you have to get to know your customer on a personal level, you have to take care of them. Um, the second thing, and we've kind of talked about this with a couple other people, uh, Matt doesn't have a degree, uh, he did all this without a college degree. So if we're here getting degrees, like what can we do with ours, it's kind of exciting. So, that's it. Okay, very good. Um, does he work for an authorized retailer? Is no, that no, corporate. corporate. Yeah. Corporate, okay. So, yeah, SPIFs are one of those things that are really interesting. A lot, particularly in consumer packaged goods, they're offered a lot to salespeople. And it's one of the things that you see that they will really charge <coughs> whatever they're getting a SPIF on. For yeah. example, the competition we just went to, the um, Great North Woods, the biggest sponsor of that is Formel. So every year, it's kind of an interesting competition to go to because all of the others focus on selling intangibles they're selling services so like the international collegiate sales competition is going to sell citrix this year um the national collegiate sales competition which is held in kennesaw state um in georgia will sell they're selling gardner this year which is a completely intangible product so a complete service which is knowledge i mean they're, they're not even selling like a service that you would think of as being like the packages that we buy for our operating systems on this they're selling knowledge about that and how to get the best deal and what kinds of packages you want. So for example, UCO might contract with Gartner to do an analysis of the learning management systems that are available out there and what our students actually need. And so it's a really difficult product to sell. But our kids at uh, Great North Woods, they sell Formel, so it's packaged meat. And they, since Formel is the sponsor of it, they have all of these for like breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It's packed. I, mean, I got so sick of little smoky sausages and stuff like that at every single thing that they did. But they offer, Hormel offers a lot of spins. And so you'll see them going in and really trying because those salespeople try to push those items that they're going to get, you know, $100 a case or something like that. And that's good. So, okay, interesting. Okay, my name is Abby Brown, and I interviewed Alan Thompson, who is a pharmacist at ERX in Oklahoma City. Um, they sell generic drugs to doctor's offices, and they actually like house the drugs in the doctor's offices instead of just like getting them prescribed to the pharmacies. Um, I interviewed him because I didn't really know a lot of pharmaceutical sales. I didn't know I know what it was, so it was a chance to like learn about another industry. Um, three of the important things I learned from him is that number one, there's a lot of like laws and regulations that change constantly. So if you have to stay up to date, you have to be constantly checking because if you if something changes and you're not aware of it, it can get you in a lot of trouble. Um, another thing is that you want the loyalty to be with you and not your company first. Like, obviously, you want them to, like, trust your company, but you're the person that they talk to. You're the person that's going to help them if there's a problem. So you want them to have the loyalty and trust with you first. Um, the last thing is that he said that you should always have, like, a plan B and a plan C to your presentation because you never know, like, when you show up somewhere and technology fails or they don't have internet or whatever. So... You just want to be always like on the ball and have something to come afterwards. And then the conclusion is that in pharmaceutical sales, it's a really um, like customer relationship based um, selling job. So like you really have to like focus on your customers and make sure you remember their birthdays and make sure you know what their hobbies and their kids' names are. That way you can keep that trust and like continue to buy those uh, drugs from you. So he actually does sell product. He's not yeah. just a missionary salesperson. Yeah, he sells um, drugs and 
and we'll have like a few different products he's selling each week or he'll go like to different doctor's offices and see what they want and then he'll go back and find the drugs that he thinks will work for them and then he'll yeah. go back. So is it like flu shots and stuff like that? Or? He said it was mainly like antibiotics and um, like the higher dose of the like higher doses of like ibuprofen and like different things like that that you have to get. Okay. Like it's not over the counter. And then also a big thing right now is weight loss drugs. Okay. So they do a lot of that. Wow. That's interesting. So most most pharmaceutical reps, if they're not selling um, a device, they actually are missionary. They're trying to get doctors to prescribe other stuff. So they do that as well. No, they strictly just do um, like selling the actual like small amount of the medications to the doctor so they can have them in house. Okay. And how big is this territory? Um, he does the whole Edmund territory. So like he goes to all the different. Um, doctors and then even some of the pharmacies too around here just to kind of like kind of clear the relationship with all of them. Okay, very good. Interesting. Thanks. I like to teach this um, pharmacy because it's one of the areas that a lot of our students actually have an interest in, but they don't actually take the time to go find um, a pharmacy rep or a pharmaceutical rep to do that. Because they're they're not most people don't have any if you're not a doctor's office or you're working in a doctor's office, you don't have a lot of contact with them. Yeah. All right. Ms. Lopez. Hi, my name is Vanessa. I interview Ray Manigusen, who is a car salesman for Johnny Roberts in Alpha, Oklahoma. The reason I chose him was because I'm new to the Edmund, so I don't know many people that do sales. And also because I went home for the fall break, and we have one many cars from him. He has been selling cars for the past five years. And Johnny Roberts doesn't uh, sell Dodge and Chrysler cars. Um, three of the most important things I learned from him is that you always have to keep a positive attitude because there will be bad days and good days. Um, you also have to deal with people saying no, and you also have to know your customers very well. Another thing I learned is that you always have to keep in mind people's perspectives and opinions because you have to take constructive feedback. So what you might think a person might like, they might not like. And I also learned that you have to always work with your customers. You have to keep learning more about them. Um, you also have to be good, really good with networking. And you have to get really fit. You have to be able to get feedback from everyone. And you have to keep working with your, your own company. So you have to be working as a team. So like someone said earlier, like let's say you miss a day of work and you don't get that customer that was looking for you, then you lose the sale. But you also have to keep in mind that you might be able to get another customer to come there. How many? How much? One of the things that I think is interesting is the car dealerships are actually trying. And Sewell is an example of this, where they people go back to Sewell. They're pretty loyal to going and buying from Sewell Cadillac. How much of theirs is repeat? About 25 percent. I'm surprised that it's not higher than that in Altus because it's not like there's like in Oklahoma City. One of the luxuries that you have in being a consumer and buying a car is that how many Dodge dealerships are there in the Oklahoma City area? There's a lot. There's a lot. Whereas if you go to Altus, how many? I mean, how there's many? There's Dodge. There? Um, there's Ford, and then there's Toyota. So really small town. But yeah, there's so there's really like enough. one Dodge dealership yeah. in town. So I'm not. I'm surprised that it's not higher. Terms of yeah, the thing the thing you said about it is that Alpha Show is small, like I said. So many of these stores are closed, and we have like a Walmart, there's like a few restaurants. But you're trying to go buy like big products. Most of the people come to Oklahoma City because they have their deals. That's what he said. Or like if you buy in like a small city, these deals are more expensive. And that's another thing he said. Like sometimes the customer will come in and it's too expensive, and I looked online and Oklahoma City is super cheap. So you have to accommodate yourself. And in conclusion, what I learned is that I wouldn't go to sales just because, like you said, you have bad days and good days, but also just because it's really hard to sell to people. Okay. All right. Very good. Good job. How's it going, class? I'm Jay Leverius. And the person I interviewed was Jesus Escobedo. He works at Bob Howard Automotives. And pretty much what I learned from him, the three most important things, you have to build a customer relationship. If you don't have a customer relationship, 
you're not going to have, you're not going to make commission. You're not going to make any money. So pretty much how to build that customer relationship is just getting to know them, pretty much your basic things, like just little things about them, like their family, like, because if you, you can take that and determine what kind of, what kind of car they need, so if you know what kind of car they need, you kind of know what they need to know, stay off their product. And the, the way he stays up on his product is by um, just doing research. And even when they come in, they're bringing the vehicles in, he just, for a couple of days, he'll go out there and he'll just mess with them and just learn the accessories and everything. So he takes all that, and then you can build a book of business, which I think is the second most important thing. Just if you don't build a book of business, you got no money. And then for the, he does that by doing um, a good customer relationship, and he takes those, and he gets referrals, and they refer to other people, and that's how he makes his uh, pretty much how he sells as far as because it's basically his referrals, and he does referral fees as well. I can't remember how much. I want to say about five hundred dollars is what his referral fee was, but. Um, that helps them as well. And then some advantages and disadvantages I thought were kind of important. That his disadvantages actually outweigh the advantages. But to me, if you take those disadvantages and work on them, you can make them to positive things and be able to help you with the business. But in conclusion, I mean, if I had to sell cars, I guess I would. I mean, it doesn't seem too difficult because I mean, I know about them, but taking what he learned on top and told me and I can think I could apply it. And, be helpful okay so how long has he been with this current dealership i want to say for three years or before i think he worked at like he met his brother in san diego but yeah okay all right so he's been there for three years how often do people buy a car i want to say like it depends um i want to say like last month he said he had like i want to say five parts so, but they said it varies really some days it is well i mean how hard. often do people buy so when you talk about building a book of business one of the things that it strikes me in, in dealing and knowing because I, I grew up with John Vance's son, who was my best friend, and his younger son was my brother's best friend. Like, car salesmen seem to bounce around a lot. And so it's hard to get people to, to be a repeat customer. Now, a lot of car dealerships are trying to change that. Sewell is one of them that's trying to change that, that's trying to really build this idea of service and quality and understanding. And so, a lot of them are doing things like sending you birthday reminders. They're using more advanced uh, customer relationship management. But, but how often does the average person buy a car? What's the average? So the average car cost today is over $35,000. That's the average. The average, all the models, they're 30. So how often do you buy a car? How many of those? Yeah. yeah. How, what's the average age of the car on the road today? It's 10 years. Because this is obviously an expensive product, and so you're looking at not selling something to somebody. You know. Well, they sell a lot of used cars, so it's not, you know, easy to easy to use. So, so I feel like you're not having to uh, worry about those high prices. I mean, don't worry. They're, I mean, some are high still for being a used car, but mm -hmm. to me, they're more flexible to buy a new car. Okay. All right. Very good. <clears throat> Hi guys, my name is Emmanuel Lopez, and I interview Alec Velasco. Uh, he owns and operates Rain Drain Solutions in Plano, Texas, and he mostly sells to contractors. Uh, three things that I learned, one of them was that in every relationship, there will be one person that is super rude to you, but you still have to suck it up, because that person will that relationship basically makes you money. So you have to kind of, he said, you have to wear a mask every time you're talking to him. Pretend that you like him, but secretly down deep, it's like this guy right here. <laughs> and another thing is that image is really important, not how you look also, but how you present yourself and also what you put out on social media. Because in your relationship, of course, they're gonna be like, oh, do you have Facebook? Do you have Instagram? They're gonna follow you, and if you, this happened to him one time, if you post something like drinking out in the bar with your friends and acting really dumb, you're gonna lose customers. And it's it's something that's really critical. You have to take care of your image, and not just like physically, but through your social media. And another thing, uh, your phone will be your best friend, no matter what, because Let's say if you forget your phone, 
or you don't charge your phone, you're not gonna pick, be picking up with those uh, customers you have or like people that you're you're basically in a relationship with, and you're gonna lose a lot of money if you do not have if you don't answer your phone or if you don't have your phone around. Um, in conclusion, <coughs> making the sales is pretty interesting because there's a big demand in Texas for the service and product he has. So I kind of would like to join his team of salespeople and work for him. Sure. All right. So he said you have to wear a mask. Is that, I mean, that sounds sort of negative. Yeah. But you have to be one person I mean, when you're... He said either you learn to like him or you, or you like just suck it up and just like... <laughs> <laughs> Do you think customers can tell when you're being fake? Yeah, yeah. Oh, maybe. Yeah. If you practice, yeah. No, if you. If you're. No, you're like really annoying. Okay. He explained to me what his customer is like, and he said So why does he not annoy somebody else? And he says that basically he likes me because I don't I have the only guys that can do the job he requests. So he's, he's like he's doing pretty well, but like he's the only person in Plano, Texas that can do a certain, a certain type of job that nobody else can. Okay. All right. I mean, I, when you say wear a mask, I don't know. I it's one of the things Benjamin Franklin. A lot of people said that you never really knew him. He had a lot of different faces. He had a lot of different masks. Does that mean that Franklin is shallow? I don't know. If he did, they fit his face fairly well. Um, you didn't get down to the, the core of the person. But for Franklin, I think the essence of life was external um, to the self. It, nece it wasn't necessarily about uh, thinking um, you know, deeply about your psyche the way Jean-Charles Rousseau did. But um, I think you could also take that to an extreme where what you're dealing with, and, and there are people who are sociopathic, and they are, they're good at wearing masks, and they are oftentimes very successful. Uh, they can be very charming. Again, going back to the double-barreled question that I asked, is there a difference between human relationship and human development? There is. Sociopaths are generally good at human relationships, at least initially. Now, it can lead to problems when people realize that they're doing what? That they're a sociopath, <laughs> that they're, you know, a compulsive liar. And so I would just say you have to be kind of careful about that. Um, but I agree that image is important. And I think that one of the things that has happened is that customers, and I like his discussion about how your phone <coughs> is your best friend, because in this day and age, customers expect you to, you know, provide the stuff. I mean, we can get stuff it's amazing. Why is Amazon successful? It's convenient. They get it to you. You have next day. You know, if you're with Amazon Prime, you can get stuff next day, and it's to your door. And people are now expecting that. And so it does mean that it is a challenge in terms of work-life balance, I think, in many instances. All right. Very good. Linda. Um, I interviewed my close friend Jordan Turley. Um, she works for Aerotech with the uh, recruiting company, staffing and recruiting. And pretty much what she does is she helps engineers get like long term, excuse me, long term careers. And uh, she potentially like sells them to a client, like sells them in their experience. So the three most important things I learned is first, you should always understand your client's wants and needs. That's like the first thing you should do, like going into the meeting with them, um, understanding really what they want with their company, what they need and what's good for them. Um, the second thing I learned is honesty. There's been a couple times that they've had mistakes like in their contract or um, they made a mistake like in their presentation or something like that and it's just easier to own up to your mistake and just be honest about it because 
that can honestly make or break your sale. Um, the third thing I learned, uh, Um, but anyways, in conclusion, um, I, I am in sales. I just do fashion sales. And so I do like retail and stuff like that. But I think it's very important that you're passionate about what you do. You don't just go into it like, oh, just because all this money and stuff. Like, I think you need to be passionate because that really is what shows you as a good salesperson is being passionate about what you do. Okay, so um, a couple things. I think it's interesting that you chose Aerotech. I'm glad that you chose business to business. And that is one that is a service. I mean, it's matching clients with the right um, sort of skill set. And that is a really unique sort of business model. And so I think that's interesting that you chose that. And I'm glad that you chose Aerotech because they are an interesting company. Understanding your client, obviously, I think is um, important. Owning mistakes. Is, is it... A, Acceptable to admit that you were wrong or that you made a mistake? Yes. Yeah. yeah. People generally, one of the things that we know about services is that if you have a service failure, but you recover from it quickly and you own it, customers are generally happier than they were before. If you if everything goes well in a service, they're actually they'll be satisfied. But if you have a service failure, this is counterintuitive. If you have a failure, think about it though. If you have a services failure and you recover quickly from that and you make it right, customers are generally more happy. So think about your own experiences with the airlines. How many of you have been, airlines always overbook flights if they can because they know a certain number of people are not gonna show up. Right? And flying has become so cheap. I was talking on the flight back with um, Dr. Workray, who's our department chair, who went with us and we were talking about the last time she went to Europe and the last time I went to Europe. And I said, you know, when I first started going to Europe, it was so expensive that I remember being on a flight that was about half full going to Germany when I was in high school. And as a result, I was able to like flip up the arms on, you know, an entire row and lay down. You can't do that anymore. They oversell almost every flight. And going to Europe is not necessarily all that big of a deal anymore. And so they know this they overbook flights and they know that people are not going to show up what happens when they overbook a flight well obviously if everyone shows up we're going to have to start bumping people and they do how many of you have been on a flight that's been full and they start asking people to bump what will they give you if you if you'll give up your seat if you'll agree to take a later flight you vouchers they give you vouchers for and southwest is the most generous about it they will give you free flights for i mean it's it's huge and people are actually happier with that, if they have the flexibility to travel, like I do most of the time, because I'm a college professor and God knows I have all, all the time in the world, particularly in the summer, I'm happy to give up my seat in order to get free uh, free airfare somewhere else. So that's a services failure. And at the end of it, I'm actually happier than I than I was um, if I'd gotten on the flight that I would initially intended to. Because now, hey, I can take another trip for a greatly reduced cost. And so that's one of the things I think is really interesting. All right, good job. Um, we're out of time, so here's what I'm going to do. We will have, since it's on the schedule, we will have the exam next class period, which will be Tuesday. It will not cover making the presentation. And then the following class period, we'll finish with talking about your sales interviews, and then we'll do making the presentation. Again, if you're offended by that and you want making the presentation chapter, which is, I think, 11, to be on that exam, you let me know, and I'll make a special exam just for you. You won't like it, but... Yeah. If you didn't sign the roll sheet, you should sign it. And I will, if you gave yours extemporaneously and didn't use notes, I will give you some bonus points on the second exam. So be sure and look at that.